Eddie Lenehan here once again and originally I came from Brosna but Brosna was always famous for music. The O'Connors, great fiddlers, wonderful people but then that's not surprising because Brosna is at the edge of Slieve Lúchra and Slieve Lúchra, well I don't have to mention to anybody in Ireland, Slieve Lúchra is Musician's Paradise, except that you'll always meet <laughs> in any paradise uh, something that doesn't quite fit in. Now, <laughs> there was a man called Sean O'Connor and he didn't quite fit in. He had a fiddle and he had a bow and a bag to keep them in, but he didn't quite fit in. He'd go along to the local Cayley and there was plenty of them at that time. And when the rest of the dancers and the musicians especially got tired and they were getting their mug of tea. Of course, nobody wanted to stop dancing because to get into a dance that time cost sixpence and sixpence was had come by. Everyone wanted to, wanted to keep dancing. And sometimes, well, the <laughs> third division musicians would be called in and Sean was that. No doubt about it. He wasn't like his brothers. And uh, he didn't realise that. Nobody wants to be thought, well, think themselves, uh, third class. So up he'd get and play and play and play, except <laughs> it wasn't quite playing, it was scraping. And you know yourself, when people be dancing a set now, or dancing a carry slide or whatever, He'd put them sliding all right. <laughs> God almighty, they'd be going this way. And blast. Will you stop? <laughs> Anybody who had a, 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 a no hippo to joint, that a hippo to joint when Sean would be finished. Uh, well, he never got to finish because it was a case of, God bless you, go home. God damn it. And many and many is the night he got a kick on the arse out the door. Go, God, go out of it. And... and that was, that was tough. That was tough. It mightn't happen now. You'd be asked politely, uh, well, <laughs> to go about your business, please. He got cut by the scruff of the neck and we kicking the arse out the door many and many a time. And tough to take in your own place. And in other places too. But this particular night, he was going with the old fiddle and the bow and his bag under his arm, <laughs> rubbing his backside. Why? Why? And there was no reason why, except he wasn't good enough. But he couldn't understand that. And he was on his way home, and he was passing this fort. And, like many another place, eh, the old fort, overgrown as forts are, because people live them alone. And bright night, bright night, and there in front of him, in the road, small man. And the man put up his hand and he says, Hiya, will you play for us? <laughs> now, after what he had been through earlier on in the night, <laughs> less, than a, less than an hour before, play? <laughs> he said nothing, and he looked at your man. Will you play for us, or won't you? There was a bit of a threat in the voice. And he says, but look, he says, I... I Play or won't play. And you see, if it was one of the boys, the lads, them, the fairies, you got your chance and with them, they always needed a human being to do their business properly. And they gave you your chance. And if you obliged them, well, you were rewarded. And if you didn't oblige them, trouble for you. No. All of a sudden he came to his senses. And, oh, I, I will, sir, he says, but, but where? What, where? And the fellow says to him, come on, come on. And in they went, in an old thorny bush gap. And there inside in the field where the fort should be, there was no fort. There there was a mansion, three stories high. No, in that parish there was no such mansion. Brushen at that time was a poor place. 
the place, the, the landlord, he lived, Collis Sands was the landlord. He lived in Newtown Sands, which was 16, 17 miles away. And there was no such a big house. But there was the big house, three storeys high, and lights blazing in every window. But there was silence. And here was a driveway up to it now, white, white driveway, straight up to the house. Now, I tell you, he began to get a little bit frightened, Sean. But the small fellow says, come on, come on, come on, they're waiting. There was no way out now. Where could he go? So... And he went with the small lad. They came up three steps up to the doorway. Up the three steps. And there stood another small fella, dressed in old style clothes, knee breeches. And <coughs> he showed them in, into this long hallway. And now Sean was looking around him. Chandeliers, fine furniture. Oak furniture it looked like. No, he was a poor man. He only lived in a thatched house. And you know, he, he was thinking, like like you or me might go into the, the Gresham Hotel. Uh, no, geez, I, what, what, what am I doing here? Especially if you had the money to pay for your dinner. <laughs> How am I going to escape from here? Uh -huh. So he, he was led down the hallway to these two big doors. Doors were opened inwards and there was this huge hall. And inside, inside, a crowd of women on one side, men on the other. And it was just like the church used to be in the old days. Women on one side, men on the other. You know, before the Vatican Council. And not a sound. They turned back to stare at him. And you know yourselves now, you know yourself, that it is, it is a very uncomfortable thing in the silence of a, any room to have people staring at you, but no word spoken. And the small fellow said, go on, go on, play, play. And there above at the top of the room he could see what looked like a, a low stage and three chairs. Obviously where the musicians were supposed to have been, but they hadn't showed up. Now, he walked up, up between the women on one side and the men on the other. And I tell you, he felt uncomfortable because there they were staring at him, staring at him. No one speaking. <laughs> and his poor fiddle in the bag in his hand. And, of course, he knew, he knew now that to have to play for a crowd like this and the women in their long dresses and the men in their fine, fine silk clothes with their knee breeches, these were gentry. These were rich people in their fine house. And he, he was, how, 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 how would he keep these people happy after he'd been booted out of his own place? But up he climbed onto the stage and into the middle chair. And it was only when he looked down, and now looking at these people staring up at him, he got frightened, as I'm sure you would or I would. But he took out the fiddle anyway, and they raised it up, and <laughs> he started, expecting now every minute that people would start firing things at him. But he started playing, wondering, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? But the odd thing was, no. The men looked at the women, and the women looked at the men, and out they came onto the floor, and they started dancing. To his poor music, they started dancing, and dancing, and they could dance. Now, it wasn't, it, he didn't know what kind of music he was playing. He was so fascinated. He forgot about his own playing and he was staring at them. Huh? And it was, the effect was like, you know yourself, or I know, or anybody would know. It was like a child at school that's used to being given out to, you're stupid, you're useless, you can do nothing. And all of a sudden he meets a kind teacher who says, good lad, great boy. Great girl, good fella. 
The more you're praised, the better you are. And here it was now, uh, Sean, who had never been danced to before or taken notice of before, he began to forget about the fingers that were so stupid and the hand across the board that couldn't do anything. He began to play and play and play, and he was there hour after hour as they danced and danced and danced, until eventually it began to dawn day. And he got a tap, tap, tap on his shoulder. It was the small man saying, Enough, enough. We have to go. We have to go. And hmm, he was led down off of the stage, down between the men on one side and the women on the other side. And the strange thing was, this time, as he passed, they curtsied to him. And there was still no word. And no word had been spoken all that night. But they smiled at him as they courtesied the men on one side and the women on the other side. They smiled slightly at him as they stared at him. And he was led out the two big doors, out of that big ballroom, down the hallway, out the main door, down the three steps and down the white road until he came to... Almost the main road, the public road, at the gap. And he was just about to go out when the small man said, Ah, 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 thank you. And you must be rewarded for what you did to us this night and for us. And Sean said, I don't want any reward. I'm so delighted that for once I didn't get a kick in the... And he was just about to say ass, but he, out of manners, he said, oh, on the backside... No, said the small man, you have to be rewarded for what you did for us. Here, give me the fiddle. And Sean took out the fiddle and the bow. And now listen, said the small man. And he played a tune. Short, but I don't know, could you call it sweet or, or lonesome? It was a mixture of both. Sean had never heard a tune like it before. It was hardly a minute and a half long. To be had to quantify the length of it. It was so strange. And the little man gave back the fiddle and the bow. Play that, he said. Now, Sean tried, but of course he couldn't. It was fairy music. And the little man took the fiddle and the bow again, and he says, Now listen. And he played it again. Gave back the fiddle and the bow. Play it again, he said. And Sean tried, but he couldn't. A little bit better, maybe. And the little man said, I'll play it one more time for you, so listen carefully. And he did. Now he gave back the fiddle, because he glanced at the sky and it was almost getting bright. I have to go, he said, but go home, practice that, and it'll make a rich man out of you. Goodbye. And... He turned, and while Sean was putting the fiddle and the bow back into the bag, um, turned around to thank the little man. And when he turned, nobody there. The white road was gone. The great house was gone. There was nothing there except the old fort in the field and the briars and the bushes. But he knew it was no dream because in his head he could hear this strange music, strange music. So he hurried home anyway and went in. No, the door was open, of course, because Irish people were honest that time. (laughs) Not like today. (laughs) But, of course, the other side of it was uh, every door was open that time because nobody had anything to steal. In he went. He sat down by the fire, took out the fiddle and the bow, and he started to play this strange music. Now, he didn't get it quite well at the start, but he played it again and again and again, and it was better he was getting at it. Practice, practice, the little man told him to practice, and he did, but he had it only played about six times. When the bedroom door opened, and out came his father big strong man. Out he came in his shirt. There was no such thing as pyjamas in those times. Out he came and his two hairy legs sticking out of his shirt. Where were you? Where were you at all? Here, 
We were up half the night waiting for you, you blackguard. And he made for Sean and his hands out. Oh, he was the kind of a man that would take you by the neck. Big strong man and he'd throw you. <laughs> there was no psychology about that man, I'll guarantee you. He was a savage, of a bear of a man. <laughs> and of course Sean knew what was in for him. What did he, he kept playing and playing. And all of a sudden, what do you think? His father started dancing, 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 dancing on the floor, dancing. Now, Sean wasn't stupid. He saw immediately that, that, as long as he kept playing, his father couldn't strike him or hit him or touch him or anything else. His father had to keep dancing, and that's exactly what he did. He kept his father dancing, dancing, and suddenly his mother came down out of the room, and she started dancing. And his brother and his two sisters down there came out of their rooms and they started dancing. Well, he kept them all dancing around the floor for the next hour and a half until his father sweat rolling down out of him now until there was a pool of sweat around him on the floor. And he said, In the name of Christ, he said, Who's up or I'll die of a heart attack? I will, says Sean, if you don't touch me. Don't lay a hand in me, all right, says the father, I won't touch you. And he stopped that cursed music and Sean stopped. And down collapsed the father and the mother too down on the floor. <laughs> and Sean had so much practice at the tune got by then that he had it got perfect, perfect. Now, he remembered, of course, what the small man had said. Mm, that could make a rich man. No, that will make a rich man. But he wasn't a worldly kind of a fella. But <laughs> a tune like that? had never been heard in the parish before, or maybe in Ireland. And the strange thing was, of course, that his brothers and sisters, or many of them, they couldn't figure out. Oh, Sean, playing music like that, that don't make sense. Wasn't he always an Amadon of an Egypt? Eh? He couldn't play nothing. <laughs> and the word spread, where'd he get it? And the neighbours, they, they came to hear it. Oh, Lord, he was hiding this from us all, all these years. Wasn't he the clever lad? And next Tuesday night he was in, in, invited over to Murphy's because it was all house dancers that time. He was invited over to Murphy's to play. Eh? And he did. And he had only the one tune, remember? Which was fairy music. And everybody at Murphy's, a lot of money came to laugh, thinking that was a great joke. But... The one tune that was played all night, the people that were listening, they were thinking, of course, that it was a different tune, different tunes, different tunes that they were hearing all night, even though he was only playing the one tune. They were fascinated. A man with such a big repertoire as that, even though they didn't know the word repertoire, that he had so many tunes, where, oh, where, where did he learn them all? A mysterious man entirely. Aye, he was invited the next night to Sullivan's. Ah, but Fat, he says, no, hold on a minute, boys, hold on. I wasn't keeping all my tunes for nothing. It's going to cost you a shilling this time. Now, a shilling was a fair bit of money, but they were prepared to pay it. And the word began to spread. And the word began to spread. Over to Mulcahy's and to uh, Roaches and this and that. And yes, for a finish, people were climbing up on the roof and looking down the chimney and listening below, below on the haggard. You couldn't get in the gate for a finish if you took two shillings and a half a crown, five shillings. Uh, a week's wages at the time. They were coming from Cashel Island. They were coming from Cordell. They were coming from Abbey Field, Kilmorna. They were coming from Newcastle West for a finish. Even from Ratkeel. And... Uh, he made a fortune. Within a year, he was able to buy a field. Within two years, he was able to buy two feet, three fields. Within three years, he was able to buy a farm. It went on and on. He eventually ended up one of the richest men in that parish. And his people are still there today, and all because he did the fairies a favour. Don't it just show, be nice to the good people, and they'll be nice to you.